Well, good morning, everyone. Getting all organized, dropping stuff everywhere. It's been a beautiful day. And Seth, except we've got to pray. Lord, we're going to come and look at your word again. Help us. Um, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you help us to be able to get beyond what we think to what you think. That as we look at your word, uh, we don't get in the road of you speaking to us. And so we need your help for that. Um, and, and I pray that as we look at this passage about relational uh, aspects of, of family, of, of dealing with others, uh, especially in the family unit, that you will be with us. Uh, for those of us who, who uh, carry pain in this area, be the comfort and the healer, uh, but also be the encourager uh, because through you change can happen and I thank you that that is, uh, that is the case. And that we don't have to do it alone, but you are with us. So as we come and look at your word, really do encourage us to be open to you speaking to us. But we ask that in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, today is the second last, uh, well, I think it's the second last, it's the planned second last series in Colossians. And it's, it's on a, a relational uh, check that Paul calls the believers to take notice of. Now, in, in chapter 3, if you read through chapter 3, Paul says that since you've been raised to a new life in Christ, there's a couple of things I'd like you to do, he says, that he recommends we do. Uh, um, I, I think the, the sort of language really is, I strongly urge you to do. Um, you know, First off, he says, do a mind check. You know. uh, look at what you think about. You know, and, and ask yourself the question, is what I'm thinking about and mentally focusing on and pouring my mental energy in uh, God-honoring, Christ-honoring, or is it actually self-promoting? Is it about me? me you know? And it's really easy to get into the me stuff because I'm really important, especially to me. And so, you know, is challenging us. What are we thinking about? And he asked that question about earthly or heavenly focused. Uh, because if you become earthly focused, you tend to become very uh, focused on the very short term. Whereas if you're heavenly focused, you actually remind yourself that this life in the scheme of things is pretty short. Um, and, and you really, in the, in the things that last, uh, the things of value in heaven. And so he asked us to do that self-check. Then he says, do a life check, uh, which we looked at last week. You know, again, asking the question, well, is the way I'm living, uh, which is going to be shaped by what I'm thinking about, uh, is that Christ honoring uh, or is it actually self-promoting? And, and we need to be a bit careful here because we can sometimes convince ourselves that it's Christ honoring when it really is self-promoting. Um, and again, it's, he challenges us to think about our character, our, our, the way we live, the way we relate, uh, and you know, just who we are. And lastly, he says, do a relational check, because it's in relationship uh, with God and others and self that our faith is actually revealed. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now, in thinking about this, with the mind check and the life check, uh, they're, they're easy to listen to. Uh, and in some ways, they're also easy to mentally agree with, you know, with, uh, without really uh, it necessarily impacting my daily life. Um, you know, we can easily say, as, you know, when Paul says, you know, think about heavenly things. Oh, yeah, I'll think about heavenly things. Usually on Sunday morning when I'm going to church, I uh, might think about it, you know, half an hour after church, about what maybe the pastor said, or maybe what someone said, you know, after church in the car park. Uh, but then I go about my daily, daily lives. Um, it, it, in some ways, there's, there's this separation mentally of between my spiritual life and my rest of my life. You know, I'm a nice, kind person at church, 
but I'm a ruthless business person. Um, you know, that sort of aspect. And so we can mentally go, yeah, 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 I agree with that, I agree with that. Uh, but it's when we come to the relational stuff, that's when it gets difficult. Uh, because the relational stuff is what Paul does is actually literally brings it home. Um, you know, it's often called the household code, uh, as it is about relationship between husband and wife, uh, father and child, and master and slave. And the words used are strong action words that we are called to follow. Words that sometimes don't sit well in our, our culture. So just have a listen again to these words. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents. For this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. So you have these words here of submit, concerning family, submit, love, obey, do not aggravate, um, which is a bit confronting uh, in, in our culture today where uh, we have these sort of egalitarian views of, uh, as normal, in other words, we're, we're equals, uh, and you know, we also have a whole world of promotional views about how to raise children, you know, uh, you, you, you don't want to, you know, you know, stifle the creativity and the potential of a child, you know, so you, you let them, you know, explore, you know, a whole range of various different viewpoints about how you raise children uh, in our culture today. And likewise, if you read on in the workplace, you have words like obey, you know, since serve sincerely, work willingly, uh, workers, remember your reward. Uh, be just and fair. And bosses, remember who's watching. Um, you know, it, th these are very much focused on relationships, whereas in the workplace today, it's often a place where people seek to get what they can with the m least amount of effort. Um, it's you know, very much a, you know, well, I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to necessarily work willingly. I'll work. I'll do the bare minimum and so forth. Um, and I won't. I certainly won't be sincere. And I'll be. You, know, you tell me to do something, and if I don't feel like doing it, um, I'll, I'll work my way around it and so forth. Words uh, like these, I think, make this passage part of Scripture, especially like in the uh, letter from Colossians, and it's the same in Ephesians, a bit awkward for us as Christians. Uh, not so much when we're reading it by ourselves. When we're reading it by ourselves, we go, we, it's, it's, you know, maybe a little bit awkward, but it's about when we actually, you know, this comes up with our non-believing friends and sometimes with other Christians as well, uh, that these passages can really generate a fair bit of um, heated discussion uh, and, a, and a bit of passion because they are a bit awkward. But what we need to understand is that when Paul's writing this, uh, the thing about the household then was that the early church were early ch in, in this era were churches that met in homes. Uh, in the New Testament period, the local church was a house church and in which individuals experienced a family-like relationship and they were treated uh, as brothers and sisters. Uh, regardless of status. I mean, that was a, a radical thing. Um, you know, it didn't matter where you were a slave, didn't matter whether you were a free person, didn't matter your, what, you know, Greek or barbarian, you know, male or female. You know, you, there was this view that we come together as, as, as a family of brothers and sisters. And, and so it's really quite important when we come to look at this section that, there's two, um, two viewpoints that we need to hold. Now, the first one is the preceding verse, which is verse 17, which says, 
And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So it means that one needs to represent Jesus well within the culture. Uh, Paul says, you know, you are God's representative. So represent it well, represent Jesus well within the culture. The other verse comes after this section in uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, where he's, he says, live wisely among those who are not, are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Uh, you know, so, so we've got to be wise about how we go, we go about living. So this passage of uh, 3.18 to 4.1 uh, about how the Colossians can, uh, is basically Paul saying how you can wisely represent Jesus within your culture. And the thing that's what we've already got to remember, Paul is speaking to the Colossians in their culture. In order to, uh, to apply it to our culture today, not only do we need to translate it from Greek to English or Aussie, uh, you know, if we're going to get it here, but also we need to tra uh, do a cultural translation from the ancient world culture to the Aussie culture today. And in doing that, the outcome is that the resulting behaviour is things that represent the Lord Jesus and shows wisdom and living according uh, accordingly, in our culture and with all its norms, uh, among those who are not believers, but we are believers. With this announced goal in mind, Paul picks up on three pairs of relationships. We're only going to look at two of them uh, that were common topics of sort of discussion about you know, how to live and ethical instruction on the household management that was found in the time. Aristotle, he wrote, the investigation of everything should begin with its smallest parts and the primary and smallest parts of the household are master and slave, husband and wife, father and child. And because the importance of household relationships was, was very clear to the ancients, you know, the household or the extended family, was, which wasn't just, bi don't forget, the household wasn't just biological, wasn't just, you know, mum and dad and the kids, you know, it was a whole generational, it was also extended family, could include slaves, could include servants, a whole range of things. Uh, but that household uh, was, was the cornerstone of society. Uh, and, you know, if, if that was out, uh, then, then everything would kind of fall apart. Uh, and, and, and the city would fall apart. So, you know, household rules were really important. Now, at the time, of course, Christians, they come along and they were initially viewed as sort of, you know, a sort of spin-off of Judaism. So, you know, that, you know, they were foreign people within the culture uh, and tolerated. But what the Christians did was something a bit different because they actually in actively invited and reached out to the local population and invited them to join them. Uh, you know, if, if you read through the, the Bible, you know, you, you know that Jews, you know, you know just to, to go into a Gentile's place, no, 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 no. But Christians actively went in and also invited um, others to come and join them. And, it, and not only did they invite them to join uh, what they were believing and adopt uh, their way of life, they actually did it without insisting on any bodily mutation, which is what you know circumcision was seen as by the Greek Roman uh, Greek Roman world, uh, and also they did it without necessarily asking uh, the head of the house permission to do so. Uh, and so, in doing that, they sort of became a little bit of a threat uh, to the, the household. And therefore, to society. So it's one of the reasons why Christians were considered quite radical. You know, for a slave not to ask the master, can you go and do this, was quite radical. And also to say, I am not going to worship the household gods anymore, was an affront to the patriarch of the household who decided what, you know, faith, you know, what gods were worshipped in that household. And it's this sort of environment that then Paul, you know, 
starts to discuss relationships. And he's, first off, he's, it's the husband-wife relationship, you know, the primary bond of the ancient, ancient household. And I would say the primary bond of our society today, and it's when this bond is going well that society goes well. When this bond is not going well, society's in trouble. Again, we need to remember that the husband-wife relationship in ancient times was not necessarily expected to be one of intimacy, uh, but rather it was a practical arrangement. Uh, it was often set up by respective parents. It was often in, in, we may be involved commercial advantages, uh, and it would often not involve those who are going to get married. Yeah, um, and we go, wow, that's... Yeah. Yeah. But it happens today in our world, in a number of cultures still, uh, where arranged marriages take place. I still remember having a, a chat with a friend whose parents were Sri Lankan, uh, which is it still Sri Lankan? What's, anyway, um, my geography is not that good. But he talked about uh, that his culture, there was arranged marriages, like his parents were an arranged marriage and he was thinking maybe, a, you know, having an arranged marriage because it took all the hassle out of trying to figure out relationship, you know, stuff, going through all the, you know, trying to find the right one and everything. So from his, you know, his point of view, you know, it was, you learn to love the person you married. Uh, interesting enough, I don't think he, he actually... I think he found the one he liked. Um, but it was an interesting mindset that he thought that was okay and that was normal. Well, that's what was here. You, you, you did not you know, go out and find your true love. Um, you know, uh, it's not kind of like the movie Princess Bride, you know, and sort of, if you've ever seen that movie, one of my favorites, um, you, know, you, know, you know, about true love. It was about what your family arranged. And and in this arrangement, the patriarchal authority of the husband was not questioned. And actually, interesting enough, it might have been your husband's father, who was still alive, who was head of the household, and his authority was not questioned. Uh, frequently, the husband was significantly older than the wife. Uh, the Roman ideal was a man of 30 marrying a woman of 15. Uh, you know, and so uh, we don't know if that was the case in Colossae, but for practical reasons, husbands uh, in most cultures of that period were significantly older because they had to learn a trade and they had to be able to support a family. And often a woman would become a wife, uh, a wife just after puberty. Not like our culture. And in that... Oh, yes. In that culture, Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands. Um, well, this was actually a culturally appropriate relationship, which Paul views as also appropriate for those who belong to the Lord, he says. You know, wives, submit to your husband. Uh, there's the Greek word, and there's this transliteration, and I, I, I was practicing it, and I'm just not going to try to pronounce it because I'm... My Greek is shocking. Uh, but basically to submit means to be submissive, to, to be or become inclined or willing to, willing to submit to orders or wishes of others or showing such an inclination. You know, and I've put down two other translations there just to sort of put it, help us understand this passage. Uh, and it's interesting, submission was a value that is ex uh, was acceptable within the church. And it's what we, we, we are called to do every day. Submit ourselves to Christ. Uh, and, uh, and, and as a Christian, you know, submission is not a value that we should be rejecting. Uh, but it's interesting what Paul does here. He says, uh, he asks women to fulfill this cultural demand, but to live it out as part of a, a virtue of their Christian faith. He says, you know, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. He, he's, he's not, you know, getting up there and uh, asking them just to blindly submit. 
he's saying submit as fitting to those who belong to the Lord. Uh, let the wife be supportive, intently devoted to her husband, for this is beautiful an illustration of a devoted to Christ. Wives, understand and support your husbands. Good job with that. Good luck with that too, trying to understand them. Uh, by submitting to them in ways that honour the master. And that's the important thing that he's changed there. It wasn't just submit, but support uh, and in ways that honour the master. You know, uh, because Paul's saying the primary relationship of a Christian's life is your relationship with Jesus. And no submission to any other relationship should overwrite that. That submission to another person should not require anything that would be inappropriate or incompatible with what the Lord requires. So some have taken this passage and says, why do you need to submit no matter what? And I would argue against that quite strongly. I, I really would. That is not what Paul is saying. He says, wives, in, your, in the culture where you had no power, you had no authority, you were under the authority of either your father or your husband, uh, or if your father was dead, maybe your brother, who, who became the patriarch of the family, you had no authority. He's saying, submit, but do it in a way that honours God. And if you're asked to do something that is dishonoring to God, that, that you know, Paul is not, he hasn't specifically said that, but the implication is there that that is not a command. In fact, that's why I would say today, uh, if there was an abusive situation occurring between a uh, husband and wife or a de facto relationship, then the person being abused, whether that's the male or the female, uh, needs to get out of that situation into a safe place uh, from which they can then work out their future and the future of that relationship. Because abuse is not compatible with what Jesus has to say. Now, Paul, interestingly enough, doesn't uh, try to uh, justify this one-sided submission. Um, he, he, he just says, look, this is the terms. This is... This is what is culturally norm, but do it in a way that honors God. But what he does do, interesting enough, is he introduces something quite radical. Um, with husbands, he says, husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. And, you know, and we go, oh, yes, of course, this is what is expected in our culture. Back then, this is quite radical. Um, you know. Uh, to love a Christian, this version, you know, the agape or agape, which we like to talk agape love, you know, it's, it's to be a strong, it's a strong non-sexual affection and love for a person and their good as understood by God's moral character, especially characterized by a willing to forfeit, forfeit one's rights or forfeiture of one's rights or privileges in another person's behalf. In other words, you know, wives, you know, we read this, wives submit to husbands, we go, oh. Paul then says, by the way, husbands, sacrifice yourself for your wives, just like Jesus. This is the kind of love that you are meant to have. You know, I love the passion. They let every husband be filled with cherishing love for his wife and never be insensitive towards her. Husbands, this is the message, go all out in love for your wives. Don't take advantage of them. Now, this is, this is quite radical um, uh, because, like as I said, marriage was often a, an arrangement and it wasn't necessarily any intimacy. But, you know, Paul comes along and says love, a fundamental part of the Christian faith, to love one another. He says love. Love your wife in the same way that Christ uh, has loved us. Uh, Ephesians uh, 5 and 25 uh, describes in terms of Christ who gave himself for the good of the bride. Uh, I'm sure that sort of imagery is, is here, even though he doesn't use those words. Love then means being self-sacrificing, uh, servanthood, nature. Um, and so, so this is quite radical. So here's Paul going, 
taking a relationship that was often practical, uh, like it was often arranged, it was very little intimacy, and he says, wives submit, that is what is wise in our culture. Husbands love sacrificially and be a great representative because that'll be a radical witness in our culture. And the irony is when you've got two people willing to do something like that, they're the marriages that we looked at. They're the marriages that seem to, you know, the two people are, 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 you know, supporting each other, encouraging each other, you know, and you sort of get, it, it's, the, they're the ones where, you know, oh, ha, you know, you've been married 60 years, how do you do that? You know? Um, we played together. We we you know, you know we helped each other. We supported each other. You know, and they're marriages that we look up to, because here is two people that actually care for each other. What happens if it doesn't work? Uh, that's that's the hard part, and that is the sad part in our society. Unfortunately, uh, this is not being applied. But as Christians, this is this is what we need to be willing to share and and and, uh, and and talk about, and not be uncomfortable by this passage here. This you know, if you've got family members who are just starting out in a relationship, and you've got a, a grandson or a son or whatever, yeah, you know, bother the ear and say, "Come here, I want to bash your ear for a second. In Colossians. Three. There's a passage that says that you, as as a big husband, or you as entering into this relationship, even if you're not married yet, you need to learn how to love like this if you want the relationship to last. And if you've got a, 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 a daughter who is a believer, by the way, uh, it's very hard if you're not a, not a believer to do this stuff. Um, say, look, if you if you if you really want the relationship to last, then be supportive. Tenderly devote yourself to your partner. But do it in honouring of Christ. Not because you're told to, but because of who Christ is. Then we come on to children. I'm going to be a bit quick here. Children, obey your parents. Uh, which is the second relationship between you know children and parents. Uh, interestingly enough, by the way, how old is a child? Hmm? You're always a child. Yeah. Oh my goodness, we've done safe spaces and we've done. Working with children, working with children's check. In our culture, how, how old, what's the legal definition of a child? Uh -uh. Yes. Thank you. 16. It's a young person from 17 and 18. Um, but as Bill said, we're always a child. And in, in Paul's time, you know, we often read the passage that says, children always obey your parents for this pleases the Lord. We often, in our culture, we think, oh yeah, that's for our kids. Um, partly that's because we want our kids to obey us and do what they're told. Um, but in Paul's culture, you were, you were always the child. You know, you can be married and have your own kids, but you're always the child. The patriarch of the family to tell you how to raise your own kids. You were meant to always obey them. Um, and the reason you do it is because, in, he alludes to, you know, because the, the, uh, there's the command, you know, children obey your parents, your mother and father, and, you know, one of the commandments. The reason is because family is crucial, but also he says because, because it pleases the Lord. Again, we obey out of our relationship with Christ. So in modern terms, it's us, you know, uh, it, as you know, uh, my parents are no longer alive, uh, so I can't do it. But when they were, it was me respecting my parents' wishes. Uh, if my if mum my wanted to do something I thought was crazy, I'd say, mum, I love you. 
but that's crazy. Uh, it wasn't being disrespectful. But to be honest, if she wanted to go ahead and do that, you go, okay. Um, it is that sort of relationship with, that we have. Um, and why? Because it pleases the Lord. You know, uh, this delights the master no end when we respect our parents. Because again, it builds up the family, the family unit. But interestingly enough, he says, Dad, you've got, you know, he goes on to say, Fathers, uh, you do not aggravate your children or they will be discouraged. Uh, the reason he just says fathers and not mothers, you've got to remember that, you know, uh, once a male child reached seven, the mother had no authority over the child. Yeah. <laughs> In our culture, we go, what? Yeah. Um, and also at no time was a child not under the authority of the father. And again, a child was not necessarily loved, but was a part of the family dynamic that may be, you know, this child is going to become the heir, so they'll get special treatment. That child is not going to become the heir, and they will be used as a resource, as it were, maybe married off or something like that. And Paul again brings in this aspect of, of almost like a guppe again, says, look, don't aggravate your children. Don't drive them nuts. Don't give them unrealistic expectations or they might become discouraged. Uh, don't come down too hard on your children or you'll crush their spirits. Uh, Paul has really challenged the father to be Christ's example in their family relationship. Nowadays, that could say mums and dads in our culture. And it's such good advice. Don't give unrealistic expectations to your children. Don't crush them, but lift them up. You see a virtue in them, encourage that. You see something that they're doing wrong, discipline them in that. But you know, be actively involved and be an active Christ-like witness in that relationship. Oops, I went too far. This passage about instructions for families, we do find awkward. We find it awkward because often, you know, they, what I think the stats now is at least half of families are mixed or, you know, or they are single parent or so forth. If you're a teacher in a school, you cannot assume that most of the kids in your class uh, have their biological parents with them. Uh, and then as a Christian, we come along and we talk about this stuff. And it's, it's awkward. But Paul's advice here is in the relationship, especially in the family relationship. We are to live in a way that those Christ, not only to those inside our family, but also to those outside looking in. And we might have family members who are doing things that are not honouring to Christ, but people will still look to us and say, well, how are you responding to that? Is it in a way that is Christ-like or is it in a way that the world does? And so he says, why? Please God, by the way that you treat your husband. Husbands, love your, your wives the way that you, know, you would. That Christ loves us sacrificially. By the way, when I use husbands and wives, you know, I'm talking about in de facto relationships and so forth as well. You know. That, that relational aspect, this, is, this still applies. But it's hard if you, if you don't know Christ to be able to do that stuff. And also, if part of the uncomfortable nature of this passage is we go, oh, I've blown this. Um, you know, 
I haven't been submissive, uh, submitted to my husband. I haven't loved my wife. I didn't obey my parents and my kids don't obey me. You know, it, we've, we've, we've blown it all. Well, this is where God is amazing because, well, today can start. Uh, husbands, you know, there's something loving for your wife. And if she says, what have you done wrong? You know, don't be surprised. Maybe that's the only time you've ever done something. You know, like lately you've done something nice and it's always, the, oops, I've got this wrong. I'll now turn up with a big bunch of flowers or, or a big block of chocolate or, you know, big, you know, a nice, you know, let's go out to dinner. It's always been, just go, no. Just want to say I love you. You will confuse her no end. Come back and try to understand husband, she'll go, I just don't understand you. That's fine. Be loving. If you're married and your wife or in a relationship, uh, in that, that sort of wife life relationship, do something that respects him and honors him. It will confuse him. You know, if he loves going fishing, do something like, how about we go fishing this weekend? He may say, what is it you want? Nothing. I just love you. I know you like to go fishing. Keep chipping away at that. There'll be times when you won't get it right. That's okay. Lord, I blew it. Please help me to uh, learn from that and not do it again. With our children, love them. Don't aggravate them. With our parents, respect them. Why? Because this will please God and honour him. I encourage you to look at these passages. There's the work stuff as well that's there. Yes, it's awkward. Yes, it's uncomfortable because of our culture. But remember those passages. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks through him to God the Father. And live wisely among those who are not believers. Make the most of every opportunity. Honour God in your relationship. Makes a heavenly world of difference. Let's pray. Lord, to submit, uh, to love sacrificially, uh, to obey, kind of goes against our individualistic, uh, my, my rights are so important, me culture. And yet you have Paul write these words in a culture where uh, women had no power where children had no voice, where husbands didn't necessarily love. And yet into that you spoke and said, honour me as you submit to me, submit to others. As you love me, love others. As you obey me, obey others. But do it out of your relationship. To me. So Lord, out of our relationship to you, help us to be those who do submit, love and obey because of who you are. Thank you for your grace and mercy to us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that for those that this passage is, is uncomfortable, that you will speak wisdom and grace and peace and mercy into their life as well. Um, 